الحمد لله كما هو أهله والصلاة والسلام على البشير النذير السراج المنير صاحب السكينة المدفون بالمدينة حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين سيما بقية الله في الأراضين وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين الحجة ابن الحسن فداه أرواح العالمين قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم يعلمون ظاهرا من الحياة الدنيا وهم عن الآخرة هم غافلون آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم Please recite aloud salawat Without a doubt Ali ibn Abi Talib is a sage and his sage remarks are not only fascinating for his followers but even for non-Muslims in fact non-Muslims are more fascinated by the words of wisdom of Ali ibn Abi Talib than his followers because his followers believe in his religious status and his wisdom is a normal feature in his character but non-Muslims see an ordinary man with an extraordinary talent we believe that wisdom doesn't come from nothing wisdom has to rest on a foundation has to have a basis for example the hadith says حرمت الحكمة على عقول يأسرها الطمع A mind that is in the captivity of greed cannot be the abode for wisdom. Or for example, the hadith says anyone who is mukhlis, who is sincere, for 40 consecutive days in everything that he says and everything that he does he displays ikhlas fountains of wisdom will flow from his tongue tajri yanabi'u al-hikmati ala lisanih George Erdak, the famous Christian author he said that I was very young I had a special passion for the Arabic language my older brother gave me a copy of Nahjul Balagha. He said, I opened the book, I started reading the passages, the sermons, the letters, the maxims of Amir al Mu'mineen. I was fascinated by him. And I thought to myself, I need to study this book. I need to dissect, analyze, try to further my understanding of the words of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Now, the words of Amir al-Mu'mineen are not just articulate. It's not only about eloquence. The insight that he gives about the life we're living, about the world we're living in, and even about the hereafter is also fascinating, is also very captivating. So he said... I decided to dedicate my life to study this book, my entire life. He was a Christian man, he died as a Christian. He never believed in the prophet of Islam, the one Ali was his advisor or his successor. He said that I, I memorized 80% of the book. Although he doesn't believe that Nahjul Balagh is a holy text, it's out of fascination. And he said that I've already read, he's, he's dead now. He said, but I've already read the book 40 times. 
40 times. You read a book once, twice, you enjoy it. Three times, four times, but not 40 times. But this is how fascinated he was with the words of Amir al-Mu'mini alayhi salam. 40 times. Ibn Abi al-Hadid, who's also a Sunni scholar, he's written one of the most famous and perhaps even popular commentaries on Nahj al balagha And he's a Sunni man. Uh, and he doesn't conceal his identity. It's pretty clear in his book that he's not, he's not a Shia. He said that I came across one of the sermons of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Because the book is divided into three sections. You have the, the sermons, and then you have the, the letters, and then you have the, the short sayings of the Imam. He said, I came across one of the sermons of Amir al-Mu'mineen where the Imam talks about death and what happens after death very articulately. He said that I have been reading this sermon for 50 years now. Every single day, thousands of times. And every time I read the khutbah, Salaku fi butun al barzakhi wadiyan, how our relationship will be with the other dead people in the grave. He said, every time I read the khutbah, it transforms me. It injects new blood in me. This is how powerful this khutbah is. Again, it's not about the eloquence only, even though the eloquence is, is like the vessel. And Amir al-Mu'mineen was, was fascinating when it comes to everything, <clears throat> including his eloquence. Now, my this was an introduction my speech is about one of the words of wisdom of Amir al muminin Now the verse says, وَمَنْ أُوْتِيَ الْحِكْمَةِ Whoever is given wisdom, وَمَنْ يُؤْتَ الْحِكْمَةِ Then he has a lot of virtues. فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the wisdom of Luqman and he sometimes in the Qur'an quotes Luqman. And the hadith says that he was given the option of choosing between prophethood and wisdom. He opted for wisdom over prophethood. And when he was asked about the reason, he said, because if God tasked me with, with this responsibility, like appointed me as a prophet, he would give me the capacity, the ability to uphold my responsibility. But when he is giving me the option I would go with wisdom. So he chose wisdom over prophethood. And this is something that the Imam had. Because first of all, he was selfless. Hadith says, You cannot become a wise person when you have obsession with this material world. You cannot become a wise person. He was absolutely selfless. selfless and he was the most sincere person you could ever find. The Imam, in one of his sayings, he says, dunya muntaha basar al-a'ma A blind person is not a person that cannot see with his eyes. Because you might find a person who is blind in the literal sense, but has a luminous heart, has inner eyes. And yet, you might find people that have the ability to see and in reality, they are blind. They don't see, they don't take lessons from life. They don't see the obvious. So the Imam says in, in this hadith, he says, A blind person is a person that limits his focus on this world and doesn't see beyond this world. Like how it was exemplified by the enemies of Imam al-Hussein and the companions of Imam al-Hussein The enemies of Imam al-Hussein out of greed and fear, the majority of the people were from the people of Kufa who had interacted with Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam, salam alaykum, who had, had attended the lectures of Imam Amir al-Mumin, so they knew everything, right? But out of greed 
And out of uh, fear from the authorities, they chose to side with the Umayyads and be part of this heinous crime against the grandson of, of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Take part in killing the grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. While his, the companions of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam, they saw beyond this world. They thought that eventually, even if we stay in this world, side with Yazid, we'll stay here for a year or two, 10 years, 20 years, eventually we'll perish. But then we'll return to God and we'll be held accountable for what we did. This is something that the enemies of Imam al-Hussein failed to see. You see how this short saying from Amir al-Mu'mineen opens new doors and adds a, 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 another dimension to our view of life. Or for example, the, the story of the magicians, when they chose to believe in Musa, Pharaoh said to them that if you believe in him, I will crucify you, I'll do this, I'll do that, I'll kill you. They said, اقضما انتقاض, do whatever you want to do. إِنَّمَا تَقْضِي هَذِهِ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا Our life in this world, this is not the final chapter of our life. This is just a transient, temporary time that we're spending in this world. إِنَّمَا تَقْضِي هَذِهِ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا And we will be judged, we'll be going to, to another world, to the afterlife. So they had a broader scope than the people that only focus on this world. And now when we come to the difference, to the contrast between this world and the hereafter, we see that there are six main differences. If I had the time, inshallah, I'll mention all of them. The first main difference between this world and the hereafter is, uh, it pertains to the description. Imam al-Sadiq says in a fascinating hadith, he says, كل شيء في الدنيا سماعه أعظم من عيانه وكل شيء في الآخرة عيانه أعظم من سماعه The Imam is saying that in this world when you hear something happened for example someone tells you that there is an accident outside a horrific accident our imagination is wild. So we'll picture something extraordinary. We'll picture bodies lying on the ground, hundreds of cars involved in this accident, hundreds of policemen, firefighters, raging fire, helicopters hovering over the scene. This is what we'll picture because our imagination is wild. This imagination produces Hollywood movies, right? But then when you go, go outside, even if the accident is horrific, but then the actual scene is much less than what you thought. The accident isn't as bad as what you thought, right? But when it comes to the hereafter, it's the opposite. Everything that you hear about the hereafter Okay, is nothing, is minimal to the real thing. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhan nas, ittaqu rabbakum, fear God, for inna zalzalat as-sa'ati shay'un azim, because there is a big, huge earthquake that will happen. And I've seen some clips that try to depict this earthquake. The verse continues to say, يَوْمَ تَرَوْنَهَا تَذْهَلُ كُلُّ مُرْضَعَةٍ عَمَّا أَرْضَعَةٍ A nursing, caring, loving mother that is nursing her child out of dread and fear and astonishment will leave her child and go. تَذْهَلُ كُلُّ مُرْضَعَةٍ عَمَّا أَرْضَعَةٍ وَتَرَ النَّاسَ سُكَارًا وَمَا هُمْ بِسُكَارًا وَلَكِنْ عذاب الله شديد. And you see people, you think they're intoxicated. You think they're drunk. They're not drunk. But God's wrath is intense. We have a lot of 
traditions, a lot of narrations that speak about, that gives us a description of, of doomsday. But every description that we, we hear is nothing compared to the real thing. The hadith says that one day the Prophet was sitting with Jibra'il when all of a sudden Jibra'il turns pale. Jibra'il who has witnessed every major event and incident, he was part of every event that happened. He turns pale, he says, Habibi Jibra'il, something wrong? He said, I saw Israfil, the whistleblower, he's descending on earth. So I thought maybe he came to blow the whistle to start the day of judgment. And I fear the day of judgment. The Prophet says that what made me grow old and look old, the gray hair in my beard, is because of Surah Al Waqa'ah that speaks about the day of judgment. Everyone would be naked in that valley and their sweat because it will be so hot will reach their chin and everyone standing on their toes. And it's not just one single day. One verse says. And then another verse says that every day in the eyes of God on the day of judgment will be equivalent to a thousand years. So a thousand times 365 times 50,000. That's a staggering 18 million years. This is why the hadith that says that some people will be punished only through being judged, uh, not being the first people to be judged, but the last people to be judged. That's 18 million years according to this opinion. 18 million years later they will be judged they will either go to paradise or they'll go to hell so everything that we've heard about the inferno for example the description cannot describe cannot portray the colossalness of the day of judgment for example it's mentioned in one of the hadith that a person died he was placed in his grave then he talked, he talked to Salman Farisi, it's a long hadith. He said to him that when I was placed in the grave, you thought that it was just like six feet under, that I was lowered in that, you know, in that hole. He said, well, for me, it was like falling, it was like a free fall for 70 years. Just this six feet that we see, felt like 70 years of free fall. And the inferno, it's something that we cannot even describe. But the same thing applies to paradise as well. The blessings, the bounties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond description. A brother a couple of days ago asked me, he said, when we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we pray to God to give us the hur al ain so that we marry the hur al ain on the day of judgment, does that apply to women as well? I said to him, there is a difference of opinion in this regard. Some say that uh, al ain is, is the plural form of Aina. Some say it's the plural fo form of Ayun. Uh, so so it, could, it could be applicable to women and men. But I said, look, we recite uh, the dua as uh, was, you know, as we received it from the Imams. But what we do, what we do know about the, the Day of Judgment and about Paradise is وَهُمْ فِي مَشْتَهَتْ أَنفُسُهُمْ خَالِدُونَ All the desires will be satisfied. And for eternity, for, bo for both men and women. So the first contrast between the hereafter and this world is that what we hear in this world is, is an exaggeration of the reality. And to the contrary, the hereafter, everything you hear is minimal, is nothing compared to the reality. The second contrast between uh, the Akhirah and, and this world is that people are treated and judged in this world according to their bank account, according to how much money they have. If you have money, people respect you. If you have money, you're treated differently because money talks. Money talks. They say if a rich person talks, 
It's gems and words of wisdom and everyone writes them down. I remember reading an article, an interview that was done with a teenager who became a millionaire through bitcoins. He was a kid. He bought maybe a thousand bitcoins from his grandmother's money. And then he all of a sudden became a millionaire. And because he has money, all of a sudden he's, a, he's an expert on economy. When you have money, I remember saying the former Libyan dictator, he was a mad man, he was a foolish man, no wisdom whatsoever. And he used to galvanize the masses, thousands of people would listen to his, to his lecture. When he speaks, he had hundreds taking notes and writing down everything that he says. The same thing applied to Saddam as well. Who was Saddam? But his words were on billboards in Iraq, on walls. Every book that you read, it was part of the curriculum. In fact, in university, you sit for a test. If at the end of the test, you write down the words of Saddam, you would get extra marks. And some people used to make up words because they were nonsense anyway. Empty rhetoric. For example, they finish the test, they write down, and the, the, the president of, of the Republic of Iraq said, don't forget to brush your teeth before you go to sleep. Wow. Words of wisdom from Saddam Hussein. This is why they famously say that if a, if a poor person, if a rich person says something, if, if a rich person spits, they say, wow, what a word of wisdom. But if a poor person speaks and says a word of wisdom, they say, who spat? That's how poor people are treated in this world. This is why Imam Ali alayhi salam says, al faqru في الوطن غربة والغنى في الغربة وطن. If you're a poor person and you live in your own town with your family, with your relatives, with your friends, with your colleagues, with your peers, because you're poor, no one ta no one cares about you. You become sick, no one visits you. No one cares about you. No one cares about what you say. No one cares about your opinion, right? But if you're a rich person that goes to a uh, visits a country, okay, and in that country he doesn't have any relatives, any friends, and because he has money, it's like his home. People treat him as if he's his with his relatives, with his with his with his friends. You have money, you could do whatever you want in this world, anything. I remember, I remember a couple months ago. Uh, I went, I was about to fly overseas, so I, I, was, uh, I was giving my luggage to, to the lady to give me the, the boarding pass. I had two or three kilos extra weight. So she said that you have uh, extra weight. I said, well, it's only two or three kilos. Suddenly she started to uh, lecture me about how dangerous it is to... Uh, overlook extra weight it could endanger the lives of of the passengers and it's it's not right you give t two two kilos and the other guy gives another two kilos and this will endanger endanger people's lives and we can't do that and after the and the entire lecture she said to me but if you pay fifty dollars for each kilogram then you're good to to, to ship it to wherever you want to go to I, I remember a couple of a uh, couple of years ago I, uh, I was part of a, of a delegation. We went to, to the Vatican. Uh, uh, we, we went from Iraq uh, to Europe. Uh, so the, the host, the guy who invited us for, for, the, for the summit was a multi-billionaire. He had a private jet. He, so he transported us with his private jet. When you go with a private jet, you don't see uh, uh, immigration officers, you don't go through uh, security, uh, you know, uh, nothing, nothing. You're, you're treated differently because you have money. So the Imam says, النَّاسُ بِالدُّنْيَا فِي الدُّنْيَا بِالْأَمْوَالِ You're judged according to your wealth. There is a place of worship that belongs to a certain denomination <clears throat> in the United States of America. People, people sit according to their bank statement. So if you're wealthy, you sit in the front row. These are the people that you have to mingle with. If you're poor, you sit at the very back. 
those are the people that you have to avoid at all costs. So people are judged according to their wealth. But in the hereafter, in the hereafter, the currency is a different currency. Over there, you leave all your wealth behind unless if you exchange your currency, turn it into something that you could benefit from on the day of judgment. Otherwise, from your wealth, all you can take with you to the hereafter is your shroud. That's it. That's why on the day of judgment, the hadith says, rich people would come, rich, arrogant people that have no deeds, no good deeds, they will be resurrected in the form, in the shape of an atom. People will be stepping and crushing them with their feet. While a poor person who is poor in this life, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the asset. He had the time, he had the opportunity to do good, performed good deeds over there, that person will be rich. Al-faqr wal ghina yawm al The real wealth is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala judges you. The third contrast between the hereafter and this, and this life has to do with the fact that in this world, we, we, we live in this world together. We, I have impact on you, you have impact on me. I can influence you, peer pressure, you can influence me as well. We're in it together. I could help you, you could help me. If I belong to a certain community, they could help me to find a job, to employ me, for example. But that's not the case in the hereafter. In the hereafter, we will have, our files will be separated. A wife that lived with her husband for 70 years, separate. Everything about them is separate. We're sitting in the same hall today. Brothers, siblings live in the same house. They have the same parents. They are judged separately. كُلٌّ آتِيهِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَرْقَ Everyone comes alone on the day of judgment and will be judged separately. Furthermore, people will be running away from each other. Relatives will be running away from each other because people want to save themselves. It's not a joke, it's serious. A father is approached by his son, Dad, help me. We're not related anymore. On the day of judgment, we're not related anymore. A father would run away from his son. A mother would run away from her daughter. A daughter would run away from her mother. Furthermore, and that's the scary part. A criminal who is about to be taken to the inferno would be willing to sacrifice his own children just to salvage himself. It's like that word of wisdom of Homer Simpson who was once there were aliens that came down to, to eat him, to take him. He said, no, don't take me. I have children, take them. So that will be this, our story on the Day of Judgment, God forbid. يَوَدُّ mujrim. The criminal would want to sacrifice his children just to save himself because it's about eternity. <clears throat> and also one of the contrasts between the Akhirah and this world is that in this world in this world you're free you have the liberty to do whatever you want to do this is why a criminal is not held accountable for his crimes a sinner is not held accountable for his sins and some people are deceived I'm sinning and God is not doing anything God is not doing anything and some people might be impacted by this they say look at this sinner he's, he's sinning and yet nothing is happening to him because this place this world is not supposed to be a place where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala judges us only in rare cases that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes or judges people in this world while in the hereafter it's the opposite over there when you go over there you cannot add a single good deed to your file when you go there you realize that you've missed out on, for example, five days worth of salat. You cannot compensate. That's it. You're gone. 
your file is sealed or you realize that you've committed sin you want to come back return me to this world I want to repent I want to say astaghfirullah but it's too late it's too late and also one of the differences between the two is that over here everything is transient everything is temporary Imam al Hussein alayhi salam when he was about to go to Karbala he wrote a letter to his brother Muhammad bin Hanafi he said Amma ba'd it was a very short concise letter he said Ad-dunya khayruha wa sharruha hulum everything we go through everything we see in this world is a dream if it's a, if it's hardship that we're going through it's a nightmare you'll wake up eventually if it's a good dream that you're seeing this joy is also transient and temporary so the people that are living it up, they're enjoying living in this world. This joy is temporary. Temporary. It will come to an end. And the people that are suffering, the people that are going through hardship, it will come to an end as well. The hadith says that on the day of judgment, after after judgment day when God judges the good people and the bad people the bad people go to hell and the good people go to paradise death will be brought in the form of a sheep and then this sheep will be slaughtered telling the people that death will not be available anymore people will not die so people in hell will rot in hell forever and people in paradise will stay in paradise forever the hadith says that if death was available, the people of paradise will die out of joy and happiness. And if death was available, the people that went to hell will die out of grief and anguish. Because they're there to stay forever. He won't feel the joy of living because he's suffering. And he's not dying. They want to die. They say, oh God, we want to perish. We want to be non-existent. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, innakum makithun. You're staying there forever. Forever. This is the vision that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam had. And this is what made Imam al Hussein <clears throat> uh, what enabled the Imam to embark on such an endeavor. Because this life is transient. They say to him, Ya Aba Abdullah, Pledge your allegiance to Yazid. You'll be immune from punishment and retribution. And we won't do anything to you. We'll respect you. How can I pledge my allegiance to Yazid ibn Muawiyah, the corrupt man? I won't do this. We'll kill you. He said, He said, this guy is giving me an option of either getting killed or living under his rule. I will choose death over living under his, his rule. What did the Imam give on the day of Ashura? Ya nafsu la tahni bi nasr al-deen Hadhi rijali Hadhi rijali Fi khutak dhabaihun Ma bayna madhbuhin wa bain his son Ali Al Akbar comes, Abba, would you give me permission to go to the battlefield? The Imam's tears begin to flow from his eyes. Bunaya Ali, O oh God, bear witness that whenever I long to see your messenger, my grandfather Rasulullah, I would see my son Ali. He hugs him, then he goes to the battlefield. 
When all of a sudden he hears his son say, Abba alayka minni salam. You don't have to come. This is my grandfather Rasulullah. He quenched my thirst. When the Imam came, he saw his son Ali al Akbar severed into pieces. Jalasa ala turab. He sat on the plains of Karbala. He said, This life is it was worthless after you are Ali al Akbar. He placed his cheek on his cheek and his chest on his chest. Shafa with Nabil Shabich Alay Rah. Shafa with Nabil Shabich. علي راح قعد عنده وصف جراحا علي راح يصيح بصوت يا زينب علي راح علي راح وانا الدنيا غدا تظلم علي رجوتك يا علي تعيش بعدي وتوسد جثتي رمس اللحود لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم والعاقبة للمتقين We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten in the reappearance of the Imam of our time by reciting dua